I'm Helen Armitage. And I'm Chris Webb. And you're listening to The Next Normal, the podcast that explores the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had and continues to have on different individuals, organisations and sectors, spying the world of business, education and careers. On The New Normal, we heard from a range of individuals about how they were adapting to a challenging climate. And we're now taking this one step further as we look to the future and quiz another slate of fantastic guests about how they're planning for the unknown, what different sectors are doing to adapt, and whether any green shoots of optimism are starting to appear in the wake of the pandemic and subsequent lockdown. Thank you for joining us as we explore what the next normal might look like for all of us on a local, national and global scale. Good morning and welcome to episode two of The Next Normal. I'm joined as always by my co-host Helen Armitage. Helen, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I'd say about a six out of ten today. Um, yeah, sun's out. Um, so yeah, all good. How are you? Is that a six out of ten on the sunburn scale or um, the <laughs> I'm definitely not a six out of ten. Yeah, I've not I've not been out um, to get myself a six yet. Yeah, so uh, no, it's on the uh, on the Rob Stevenson um, chart. So yeah, six out of ten today. Yeah, good to hear. Yeah, no sunburn for me either. Probably about a seven, having a, a pretty good week. House hunting, always quite exciting. So yeah, not, not a bad week at all so far. Uh, we're really pleased today to be joined by uh, Oriel Majumda, who is a creative coach, uh, supervisor and consultant uh, who runs her own business, uh, Oriel Majumda Limited. Uh, Oriel, very, very nice to have you here today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I didn't realise we were going to grade ourselves. Um, so what am I? Am I? Oh, yeah, it's a good day. I'm about a seven, seven and a half, seven point five on the scale. Sunburn, um, no sunburn. So Four factor 50, sun hat, jobs good. That's great to hear. Yeah, always a good start when none of our guests or hosts have sunburn. Great start for the podcast. Um, and as always, to kind of continue that great start going, uh, we're going to go through our gloom balances, our good news stories for the week before we kick things off. So, uh, Helen, any good news stories you'd like to share with us this week? Um, I'll be honest, I found it quite difficult this week. Um, I think the government recent announcements things that happen happening globally politically everything it feels like it's quite um a tough week but i'm holding on to the positive and really um thankful email that, that i've been receiving from lots of students and, and new graduates um thanking me for the support that i've been offering through one-to-one appointments group work sessions um just quick quick questions that they keep asking me over email um, so yeah, I've been holding on to those, and it just shows that even during these current times, that um, you know the, the impact and the positiveness that I'm able to provide our students and graduates has been has been really kind of um, uplifting for myself. Yeah, that's uh, that's really really great to hear. Um, I've spoken to a few teacher friends recently, actually, who've told me that they found that some of their students who they've been working with uh, online have been a lot more grateful than they perhaps were when they were in yeah. school. So uh, you wonder whether there is some sort of semblance of because we're all in some sort of similar boat. Um, there's yeah. a gratitude going around, which is, which is really good to hear. Um, mm. Oriel, any uh, good news stories you'd like to share with us? Uh, so I was in a similar boat to Helen, but last week I, I had a bit of a funny flat week um, where I wasn't particularly motivated. So this week feels better by comparison. Um, my good bit of good news is I'm, um, I double in writing poetry, but I've, I've very kind of um, self-taught. And I've been following a poet called Kate Clanchy, who's a teacher. She just and she posts loads of her um, pupils' poetry, which is just epic. And I've been a massive fan of hers for a while. And um, she's running a, a poetry in lockdown work workshop, so masterclass on Thursday for the Avon Foundation. So I looked it up, thinking it was going to be hundreds of pounds, and it was thirty-five quid. So I booked myself on it which feels like a bit of self, like you know the self-care stuff but I'm really looking forward to it because I haven't done anything for me for ages so um and who knows I might come out of it with a few poems who knows where it's going to go so yeah that's that's my thing that I'm looking forward to this week oh fantastic that's really really brilliant to hear I think earlier on um in the podcast sort of a few weeks ago we were talking about everybody having the great lockdown novel but I've seen quite a lot of uh, poetry coming out and that sounds like a really interesting opportunity so be keen to hear how you get on um, and a final uh, good news story, I think, from me this week, or, or maybe not necessarily a good news story, but something that's happening that's maybe quite interesting and that uh, maybe a few people will be sort of pleased to hear about. And that is a UK-led research team um, launching an initiative to basically track what's been happening with wildlife uh, before, during and after the pandemic and looking into what they describe as this sort of um, anthropause 
So what's happened with humans kind of leaving natural space or sort of built up space, you know, with animals kind of coming back um, and what impact that might have. And, and one of the academics involved in that was involved in similar research after the Chernobyl disaster. So there's apparently quite a lot they can learn from that and, um, and how that impacts on the natural world. So quite an interesting one uh, to keep track of, if not necessarily a good news story as such yet. Yeah, I think that was really interesting. I'll be interested to keep up to date with that. because I, I've, really, I've been following the pictures uh, that keep coming up on the news and Instagram as well of all these um, animals that are in spaces that are normally densely populated with humans. So, um, yeah, interesting, definitely. OK, we'll just kick off then, Oriol, with if we can find out exactly how COVID-19 lockdown is impacting yourself both personally and professionally. How have you found it? So on a professional level, just as I was, um, just as we went into lockdown, I was working my notice at Sheffield Hallam. So I had been a course leader in the business school running a, a master's in coaching and mentoring, which I've been doing for a couple of years. And I'd handed my notice in and worked a long notice uh, to allow for recruitment and what have you. And uh, it was due to come to an end at the end of March. And then I, we went into lockdown. I, I locked down on the 17th of March. So it was a bit <gasps> eek. And the, the plan was always that I was going to go back to um, my private practice. So that's coaching, um, supervising coaches uh, and do a bit of teaching. So I was really worried when it started. I was thinking, you know, could I have done it at a worse time? But actually, it's been fantastic. So work has just take, completely taken off because everything's gone online. So, I, you know, I'm doing as much, if not more coaching than I was doing before doing loads of webinars and different you know kind of just using different formats really to do the work that I would have done in person so something some things have gone some um some bits of work I've lost or you know they've been postponed to later in the year so doing kind of big workshops for organizations but loads of it's gone online and then I'm still teaching on the masters and that's all gone online and it's been really great we work with quite small groups anyway it's a, you know it's a, a small cohort and you know if you'd asked me if a few months ago whether we could do we do loads of skills practice and stuff and if you'd asked me I would have said we wouldn't be able to do it properly online or, or we you know we'd definitely lose something and actually I've been proved wrong it's it's been really in I want to use the word intimate like you know it feels as personal and as close yeah. up and um so that's been great and then doing loads of things like this and talking at different different kind of professional networking things and I've been blogging so I got commissioned to write a blog right at the beginning by the Arts Marketing Association which has been great so I've had they asked me to do four real-time reflections on the pandemic and it's just been really a really great discipline for me to sit down and write what you know about what's going on and what I think and I've been trying to put bits of theory in there as well um, that people can go off and have a look so I don't want to sound smug or insensitive, but for me professionally, not too, not too bad. You know, actually, yeah. better, way better than I would have thought. To the point where I'm thinking, I don't know if I'll ever <laughs> go back to how it was before um, when I was travelling around all the time. And then I suppose on a on a personal level, more tricky. You know, like it has been for lots of us. But I'm very very hashtag blessed. You know, I've got my family. You know, my husband and my older uh, my youngest child who's at 17. She's at home. Um, you know, we're really privileged, got a nice house, nice garden, we're, you know, we're all in work. So, yeah, so, it, you know, I, I can't complain, really. But but it's been, it, you know, it's had its ups and downs, I think it's fair to say. And yeah. those moments of, uh, oh, my God, what's happening? Kind of, you know, existential dread kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but on the whole, not bad. So, yeah, that's where I'm yeah. at, really. I think that's something, I mean, Chris and I have spoken about this in previous episodes, that I think when you, when, in the grand scale of things, things are okay we're very fortunate we're still employed we're able to carry on and, and, and you know do our jobs to the best of our ability online and we've not suffered massively um but it's always interesting to hear that there are people in the same boat and, and like you say there has been that, those roller coaster moments as well that is you know there have been some kind of darker times shall we say but um but yeah it, generally things things are okay definitely Okay, good. Right, so the first discussion topic that we've got then is, as we've kind of said, we've, we're all kind of doing okay in lockdown, but it's been an incredibly difficult time for um, a, lot of, a lot of people really at the moment. So for students and graduates in particular, they may have felt quite deflated, lacked motivation, they're confident in themselves and their studies might have decreased. So how do you think that they can maintain their motivation and confidence in such an uncertain time? It's a great question. A lot, lot of the people that I've been coaching through lockdown have 
been reporting the same thing. So feeling really sapped of energy, um, scared about the future, worrying about, you know, how, how whether they're going to have jobs or if they're out going out into the employment market, what's going to happen. So, so I really get it. My, my older, my oldest is 20. He's a musician. So, you know, immediately after as lockdown happened, all the, the clubs and you know opportunities to for him to work just went overnight and it looks like they're going to be the slowest to come back so you know I really do get that it has such a terrible impact and I think for me when I've when I've thought about this if any of us look too far into the future it's so unknown it's so unpredictable I mean nobody not even the best futurist can tell us what's coming coming down the line I think it will give you the wobbles you know so for any of us even us three you know we're in employment and mm. we've just said you know things are kind of looking okay but I think if you if you do that kind of trying to look forward it can look really catastrophic so mm. I th- I'm all for daydream dra- daydreaming imagining the future thinking about the things that you want to achieve I think those are all really healthy and necessary but if you if you try and plan on that basis, it's like it just drops off a cliff edge. So you're going to give yourself a feeling of, oh, you know, what's going on. So I think for me, it's a it's a balance of just, just focusing on what's happening now. What have I got? What can I do with what I've got? And then just kind of gradually taking it, not, you know, maybe a day at a time, a week at a time, a couple of, couple of weeks until things become more certain. So there's no I mean I'm a very kind of pragmatic person I think there's no point worrying about stuff that you can't control so if you look at Stephen Covey's work you know what's in your circle of control what's in your circle of concern so the concern stuff is all the stuff in the world that you could be terrified about yeah. and actually if you waste a lot of your energy on that you're going to feel very powerless you know thinking about everything the whole world mm. you know so for me I mean it sounds kind of the opposite of what we tell tell younger people as they set off on their careers but kind of re- contract your world a little bit, you know, just, just focus on what you can control. And the things you can control are usually, in my experience, are the real basic stuff. What am I eating? What kind of, you know, I sound like such a mum. I mean, it is, I have got strong mum energy, but those, those things that, you know, your carer was, carers would tell you, fo- focus on looking after yourself, get some food, get some sleep, get some fresh air, go for your walk. All of those kind of things, because if you, you know, try not to drink too much, try not to do stuff that, that is bad for you, because it will make you feel really rubbish, Re- you know, even worse than you do anyway. And then so do those kind of basic things. If you can get a spot in your house, you know, you might be sharing or uh, you might have gone back home uh, to parents, or whatever. But get in a spot, a spot in your house that feels good for you mm-hmm. So make it your nest, make it how you want it to be, get your music sorted, all of those things. And try and make your physical surroundings work for you. You know, what, even if it's a little corner in a room, so that it's something that's yours. And then so you're controlling the things you can control. Yeah. And then I would say, turn off comparison. You know, the things that give people real nightmares is looking at Insta, which everybody knows is nonsense, but everybody's successful. Everybody's got, you know, the great internship, the great opportunity. And it's really easy to, to look at social media and think, that that's true but we all know it's not you know it's it's showing your shinier side isn't it so Mm. I would say try and look at that with with a cynical eye and just go okay that's that's people trying to you know show the world that they're getting on not that it's actually true and tune that down because you're doing okay if as long as you're getting up having some food taking a walk whatever you're you're doing the best you can so be kind to yourself don't don't beat yourself up and then do little things like I'm going on this poetry workshop It's a tiny thing for me. I know that I'll feel great afterwards. So just look around and do those things that make you feel good and and don't wallow in the stuff that makes you feel bad. So if you've got people around you that you know drain your energy or that you feel anxious when you're around, I'm not saying cut them out, but just try and balance it by talking to people who make you feel better or who listen to you or who support you and, you know, kind of create a community that you feel okay with and just take it day by day. So I was thinking about, about coming on this podcast. I, I lived through the 80s. So I was in my, um, so I was born in 62. So in 82, you know, the depths of recession, minor strike, all of that stuff would just come out of the 70s during all the um, three day week and power cuts. And, you know, it's pretty grim. So in the early 80s, there I was coming out of uni and into, you know, employment was at I mean, I don't even know now, three million, whatever it was, but it was really bad. It was as bad as it is now. And there was no prospect of me getting any job. And I was a good, nice middle class girl with a good education. And actually, I just made the most of it. I decided I'd had enough of the of the treadmill of being in education. 
and I did all sorts of things. I volunteered at a radio station, did a bit of DJing, um, used to go go and do the door at clubs and I don't know I just I kind of stepped off for a bit and then kind of stepped back on when things happen so my I suppose my learning is that I would say to people don't don't so don't cut catas- catastrophize is that word don't don't yep. think too far ahead because because who knows there is no known what's going to happen mm-hmm. make the most of the moments that you're in find some useful interesting things to do that make you feel good and develop skills but also it's an opportunity to find out what you do like i mean you know if you do have to go on benefits for a while or get a shelf stacking job it's not the end of the world it'll be great learning for you and you are going to be all right i mean because things do work out so here i am all those years on from the 80s and i've got a really flourishing career and it did me no harm whatsoever and and it'll be the same generally for most people yeah absolutely and i i completely agree with that and i think what you said taking each day by day bite-sized chunks i am a massive fan of stephen covey's work um his book um the seven habits of highly effective people is one of my lockdown books um that i'm reading at the moment and i i love it that circle of control circle of influence i think is it's changed my outlook on things completely um because i you know, read the news and, and look at things and think, oh, I think oh my god like what's happening in the world what's happening yeah. but stuff you can't control and so just zone it out and then just yeah. think about what you can control and I, I do think if younger people younger students and graduates that are moving into industry now follow exactly what you've just said do things what they can control focus on the now not the six 12 month time I think it won't be as bad as as what they think and Chris and I yeah. have said before that I mean we both graduated in 2008 and used to hear so many times when it's the worst time to graduate it's the absolute worst time to be a graduate and you hear it enough times and you start to believe it but you think well we've come out okay uh, well think for myself chris <laughs> but, but we've come out okay we're showing it okay yeah. so yeah i just think it's it's not as bad as you know what it might be or even if it is as bad you know so say say we are headed for you know the worst recession for 300 years as they're saying you can still be okay and the you know so you might have to go and it's a lot of it i think is about expectations so if you've got you know and i really get the heartbreak of plans changing Mm. you know my oldest had a summer full of gigs that were booked and you know he's booked to play and all sorts of exciting things that him and his mates were going to do you know so you so there is a kind of grief about losing those when you had great plans and then it's not happening Mm. But especially for young people, you're going to have loads of summers to come and you will, yeah. the good times will come back. So, mm-hmm. so remember that, you know, it's OK to feel sad about the things that aren't happening that you wanted to happen. But, mm-hmm. it's, but it's not the worst thing in the world if you end up doing, you know, a job just to get by for a bit. And what it will do is make you a kind of deeper, more interesting person because you'll have had some experiences yeah. and things will pick up. I mean, economically, what happens in deep recession is the government comes along eventually and we'll put things in so i was sent on a on a community program in my day they had the um youth opportunity scheme and, and community program and i had i had the i was laughing the other day thinking about it because i had a choice between working at radio sheffield and then working in an advice center and i went off to have quite a big career in advice work because i was so political and into it and that's what i chose and now i'm thinking flipping it why why did i choose that why didn't i end up in radio sheffield who knows but but you know so what tends to happen is there are rescue plans or um yeah. schemes or whatever and so those things will come up because it's not it's it's not sustainable economically to carry that much unemployment and i think the people who make the best of those those things that come along are the people who are developing resilience i mean that's the word we're not saying isn't it but yeah and for me resilience is an ability to flex it's like a you know they don't build skyscrapers really rigid because they fall down when the winds come they build them with a bit of flex in them so Mm -hmm. that they can withstand the you know the kind of um the storms and what have you so i think that's true of people if you can just roll with the punches a bit but it needs a kind of got to be kind to yourself through that because if you're forever comparing yourself or telling yourself what you should or shouldn't have done and you know you're going to have a really miserable time and then when things do come up you're going to miss them because you you're two heads down so i know it sounds really bad but think of it as an extended break you know this is a lot and an enforced break what's the best you can do with it and if it's Mm. sitting in the sun and, and thinking and reading some great books why not why not just do that
Absolutely, Aurel. And I think your comment about comparisons as well, I think will really resonate with a lot of people. I think we saw a lot of it at the beginning of lockdown. You know, what are you going to be doing to use your lockdown proactively? And everyone was going to be learning three languages, playing the bassoon and uh, and all this sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. You know, looking at other people, it's so easy to imagine that that is happening across the piece. But of course, everyone's in a different situation. And as you say, for a lot of people, simply getting through a day in lockdown is is an achievement, you know. for all of us really so so i think this is some really really um, interesting points to, to kind of reflect on there um now you mentioned earlier obviously that uh, you've kind of been involved in in some of your sort of coaching work with both uh, industry and with um, sheffield Hallam university as well um and so i guess you know one question we were we were quite interested in asking really is for any industry professional listeners uh, who are maybe within management or leadership roles in the he or other industries um, how do you feel they can potentially continue to lead and motivate their teams in these uncertain times and if there are any particular strategies they can adopt on that front yeah it's um it's something i'm being asked about a lot actually from from industry itself so um i won't name the organization but at the beginning of lockdown i got a call from from an organization i've been working with for a while and they wanted some sort of rapid response coaching so people could just drop in quickly kind of offload process stuff and now they're thinking about their strategy onward strategy and leadership and I think, I mean, I think being a leader in any context at the moment is a real challenge for a number of number of reasons, because you're being asked to give some certainty where there is no certainty, to give clarity, probably where things are very muddy and unclear, and to be encouraging and um, reassuring when you probably feel like crap yourself. So, so I think there's a real, it's a, it's a real ask of leaders to, to, to be able to keep people's motivation and spirits up while they're going through difficult things themselves. And I'm thinking of all the people I know who are in those positions who are homeschooling all of a sudden, for instance, or sit, you know, they might be really big head of whatever and they're sitting on their spare bed trying to run a company or, um, or I don't know, all the people at Hallam who are teaching running courses and they've had to, to come to, you know, come to grips, get to grips with um, online teaching and doing all the the pastoral work with students and you know etc etc so so i suppose it's a big challenge it is a big challenge and i don't think there's any simple answers i think there's something about resilience again for me so there's an act of leadership that says take i need to take time out it's back to stephen covey again you know sharpening your saw so that the saw remains sharp so you the sharp his sharpening the saw idea is that you in order to to carry on being good at whatever role you're doing so like leadership you've got to periodically take time out to refine your instrument, keep, you know, look after yourself so that you can go back out and do the things you need to do. And I think it's critical for leaders to kind of develop good boundaries. So it's very easy, especially at, at the beginning of lockdown, I saw this quite a lot, to go into a kind of heroic model of leadership that says, what I need to do here is just give 10 million percent until I'm absolutely drained. I've got to go out and just prop up this whole thing. Everybody's relying on me. And I saw it loads. And then what happens is you fairly quickly burn out. And so now what I'm seeing is people being a bit more. So there's there's always a kind of crisis mode, isn't there? People go into crisis yeah. leadership. If you look at, can't help it, you see this is my academic background. But if you look at Daniel Goleman's st- leadership styles, there's some of those styles um, where you go straight into being authoritative and directive in a crisis. This is what's needed. Follow me. And I think the time that that had its time at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was kind of going, what the hell now, what do we do? So you need very strong direct leadership then. Now that things have eased off and, and we can plan a bit more and be, you know, at least in the short term, we know what's coming then people can go into different kinds of leadership that are probably more facilitative or democratic. So so now I think the skills are listening, communicating really, really well. I mean, I th- just think that's critical. The organisations where it, where things have gone well, I think, are the ones that have affected this art of listening. And so they're really listening to what people done are, are doing and what they want. They'd listen to the kinds of support that they need. They're, they're doing, I suppose I call it pastoral care, but they're um, leaders that are are willing to kind of share the load a bit and skill people up and mm. give people space to make some mistakes though you know those kinds of they call them softer skills but i don't i don't think they're soft you know so those skills of just kind of being a human leader and i think the other thing leaders can do is create so they can be role models and i think that's a really challenging thing to do at the moment but if you're working flat out and exhausting yourself that's what your people will do mm. if you're modeling you know being resort- resilient taking care of yourself 
um, prioritizing all of those things then that's what people will do in your team so I think 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 about your leadership styles think about the kind of range that you've got to draw on think about what's needed for what's in front of you and it so you're not just one kind of leader you might you might be moving into a coaching kind of style for one thing and be more more directive for something else but just be kind of I suppose have a more nuanced palette really than just I'm just going to drive 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 yeah. and I think there's something about humanity you know talking talk and vulnerability talking about the things you know that's why I don't mind talking really openly about the struggles I've had in lockdown because I think it encourages other people to you know yeah. then they go oh my god well if she's saying that then maybe it's okay for me to feel like this yeah. so you know and of course you have to keep the keep the day job going as well yeah. um so it's a tall mm. it's a tall order on, on that note Aurel, any um any examples of sort of leadership in the public eye that that you would really spotlight during the pandemic crisis so obviously names that you're working with you might not be able to share no. in terms of kind of public world leaders or, or leaders of big organizations i mean there's all the obvious ones aren't there in terms of you know prime ministers and presidents and what have you and, and mainly bad examples I, I suppose I'm thinking about and again I, I don't want to name names I'm working with a, an organization at the moment and it's a big arts network organization and they I mean this is just such a practical thing but right at the beginning I, I was, I'd been contracted as a freelancer to do some stuff all through the year and normally I'll just invoice after I've done each bit of delivery and up front as soon as the pandemic happened they, they got in touch and they said, send us all your invoices right now. We're going to pay everything. So they've paid me just for the whole year for all the stuff I'm going to deliver on trust. I mean, we have worked together for a bit, but I was just thinking that, I mean, somebody somewhere has decided. And in terms of keeping the economy, the cultural economy going, you know, because let's assume if they're treating me like that as a freelancer, they're treating all their freelancers like that. Mm. So, so suddenly there's freelancers that are going thank god for that you know i've got some money i mean for me when i was at the beginning of the lockdown thinking oh am i going to be you know what's going to happen because i wasn't mm. furloughed or anything because i'd left hallam so you know there was nothing um nothing certain mm. it was an absolute lifeline to me and it also what it did was give me loads of confidence it's like yes it'll be it, you know there will be and I, I did a spreadsheet with every month and where the income was coming in and it's like oh yes there's bits you know there's bits coming in towards the end of the year so it'll be it might be okay and I think that is a real act of so the act of leadership in that for me I think is to put yourself in the position of the people in your kind of ecosystem or ecology yeah. so they they really understood what what it was like to be a freelancer I mean, it's fantastic in terms of in terms of loyalty. I mean, imagine I'll do anything for them, you know. Really, mm. and and in fact, I talk to all sorts of people. I'm actually working with the the organisation that funds them as well, and I've just been saying how great they are. You know, this mm. was the, how great they treated me because I think it's a shining example. So it's not. I don't know financially if that's a simple thing to do, but you know, it sounds very simple. Just pay freelancers up front. Mm. But I think that's a, there's something very smart going on there in terms of leadership. Absolutely. And I think you've kind of really sort of identified there, obviously, different styles of leadership. I think a lot of people, when we talk about leadership, think very much exactly as you said of, of a prime minister or a CEO. Yeah. And, and actually, it's, it's that leadership within the field or within the sector, um, of which I think James Timpson is, is another really good example, very good person to follow on Twitter. You know, they, they've been doing some brilliant things in terms of how they've treated their staff. And a lot of consumer insight surveys really kind of keying on members of the public saying, well, actually, the, the businesses I'm going to stay with and shop with are the ones who, you know, we feel have covered themselves in glory during the pandemic rather than those who've maybe been made to look a little bit um, uh, dubious in terms of some of their actions. Top of the pods are our podcast recommendations, trademarked, so don't try and steal it. And uh, we just wondered if there are any particular kind of podcasts you're listening to at the moment that you'd be interested to share with our listeners. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm allowed more than one, I hope, because uh, I've got three, so you can have them whether you want them or not. Um, so I've been listening to, really, it's a real classic, Louis Theroux's Grounded, because he just makes me hoot. I love him. But I'm really, he's just such a fantastic interviewer. And of course, mm. my business is all about talking to people and asking questions. And he's just, he's just superb. I mean, he's just, he's just the most natural, effortless interviewer. So, I've, and, and they're funny. So I've been listening to those. And then I came across one, uh, it's not new, but it's newish to me, called The Last Bohemians, which is, it's podcasts with loads of different older women, basically, but they're all, it's all mavericks. And so there's um, Cozy Fanny Tooties and there, um, Sue Tilly, who was Lee Bowery's 
and Lucian Freud's muse, uh, Zandra Rhodes, the designer, uh, mm. just load, Bonnie Greer, the, the critic and writer, just, and they're fab, they're really nice. And then the other one, a little local plug, is the Naked Podcast, which is two BBC um, journalists in Sheffield who interview loads of different women. There is a man's Naked Podcast, but they don't do it, Other uh, a guy does that. Um, and basically, the interviewees strip off, and they strip off, and it's nothing to do with nudity, you just that's just how you do it and then it's just an interview about them and their lives and the reason I'm really into it it's fun a it's fantastic b I did it I was in the last series so, so I went along to this house for one one of their houses and it was in the middle of winter it was in February it was really cold and I got into into the front room I mean I knew this was going to happen it didn't surprise me and then you basically take all your clothes off and have an interview it's just fantastic so so you can go and sh um, search mine if you look for the naked po podcast but they've won loads of awards for it and it's and the idea it was funny when they asked me to do it because i said yeah yeah of course i'd love to do it and she came back and went you do realize you have to take your clothes off i was like yeah yeah i don't mind i'll, I'll do that but it's um there's something really interesting as they maybe you'd like to try this for future ones so if you <laughs> if, if you all if you all get in the buff I don't know it's like all your inhibitions go so then the conversations I can see Chris is looking very um, intrigued at the prospect <laughs> I'm just wondering how we're going to convince our next guests about this but yeah uh, so have yeah. a listen have a listen to the naked podcast but it's brilliant and the and the um all the women they interview are just just so interesting it's loads of you know yeah. there's just I think we're in series three now so um they're on on the BBC sounds up but yeah, it's, it's great. And it was really, really good fun to be part of that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, like you say, I, I just hope that it will change customer loyalty, really, and customer kind of behaviour, really, as to who they align themselves, which companies, which retailers, which brands. I think it will be interesting on the other side of this, how um, the economy shapes up in that way. Really yeah. interesting. Looking yeah. at the music industry, it's interesting um, around Black Lives Matter. So so suddenly I'm an expert in techno and electro electronic music because of my son. So, But I've been reading a lot and there's there's a lot of corporate shaming going on around their commitment to diversity and their appropriation black music and to the point where if people if co big companies are saying that they've uh, donated to black lives matters um various causes they're being asked to put up their receipts to yeah. prove that they've done it i mean mm. that's some that's some people power isn't it yeah. i mean i'm not sure what i think about public shaming but but in terms of you know so even a cynical company can look at that and go well we better change something and be at least you know be able to show that we're doing something because mm -hmm. we're going to lose this bit of the market yeah. so I'm, I'm really hopeful that there'll be some shift Right, so focusing on the positives, so you mentioned a bit at the start about how professional life has been okay, it's kind of taken off quite well, and then personally during lockdown, um, you've been okay and had more time at home. So has there been any kind of specific positives for you and any anything that you've learned during this time that you'll take forward beyond lockdown as well? Yeah, a few things. I mean, it, it seems a classic experience, actually. Um, because I talk, because in my line of my work, I talk to loads of people, and there's always a bit of a kind of have you been social stuff at the beginning, you know, just kind of chat, and and loads of people have been saying, you know, I'm, I feel a bit guilty, but I'm really enjoying it, and I've heard that so many times, mm -hmm. and so then I always say, you know, because I'm nosy, I like to know what people are, are up to, and I'm like, well, why have you enjoyed it? And it's the same stuff I enjoyed. So I, I was thinking back to when lockdown first started and it was do you remember it was very cold up north and then in Sheffield mm. and then but really really clear and I mean I go walking anyway and I always used to walk into work and stuff but to purposely go out to get some fresh air you know in our state mandated daily walk but mm. you know to to commit to going out getting some fresh air and I remember walking and just going saying to my husband this air feels like a cold drink of water it's absolutely crisp and gorgeous and the sky was blue, there was no kind of city noise, and it was just superb. And I just really, I realised how much I enjoyed it and how much I needed it to clear my head, whatever time of the day we do it. So I was just thinking, such a simple thing, why, why am I always too busy to prioritise those kinds of things? So just the, the still and the quiet, and I'm someone who's just on the go, or, or was on the go the whole time, mm. just kind of fidgeting and, you know, just doing some, doing stuff. And I really even though I'm busy at work, I'm, I'm much more, I don't know, I've, I'm saying no to more things than I ever have, because I just think I don't want to, to 
run myself into the ground like I have been doing. Mm. So, so just kind of thinking about overwork and, I've, and just having a bit of time to think, yeah, I know what I was doing. I was keeping busy as a, just my habit and I've never even questioned it. So not feeling so tired all the time. And I was talking to a guy the other day who's a, he's retired now, but he was a very, very senior in a big um, multinational. He was on our coaching course, actually. And I said to him, oh, yeah, I, I miss the traveling. I used to quite enjoy it. And he said, but I'm not so tired now. And he said, yeah, we always pretend we, like he said, I thought, I think we tried to convince ourselves that we enjoyed traveling because we had to do so much of it, but actually we just tolerated it. And I thought, yeah, you're spot on, actually. You know, I always used to think that I really enjoyed it because I could stare out of the window. But actually what I really enjoy is, you know, getting up half an hour later and just kind of waking up naturally and getting up and pulling mm. on kind of trackies and you know that's what I love yeah. and being really focused on my work because I'm not having to do all the other gubbins around it that that's yeah. what I like so those those things I'll carry with me yeah definitely I'd say the same I think for me it's kind of um I used always used to be quite happy within a city center um always like the hustle and bustle of cities um I was in New York in December um but and you know i love new york as a as a place to visit but now i'm not keen on them (laughs) it's um it's really changed i'm preferring a lot more space and where i am now i'm quite fortunate we've got quite a big garden and got a lot of space and i just quite like that and i had to go into sheffield today and i I just thought no 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 i'll leave i'm leaving now i'm leaving no it's uh and so that i think that that's something that i'll stick with on the out on the kind of when we come out of this to enjoy that that space and that not not feeling so closed in and in a crowded space it's um, really interesting yeah yeah I, th- I think it's one of those things that's definitely hit people differently hasn't it you know my partner and i'm searching for a house at the moment and i think you know i've always been one of these people as well love cities we used to live in tokyo loved it you know <laughs> probably yeah. the biggest city you can live in yeah. and um, and yeah it's de- you know it's totally changed my perspective i think having green space nearby has been a, a massive boost I, I, I struggle to imagine what it would have been like to live you know sort of in maybe a cramped flat in the city center and, and yeah. not having that nearby so i think yeah. you know, it's yeah. certainly made people appreciate uh, you know differently what they value so thank you very much Ariel. some really really interesting reflections there for our listeners thank you so much for joining us today for the podcast uh, for those of you listening at home uh, any of the links that were mentioned will be in the episode notes uh, and if usual if you've got any questions at all about the content in today's podcast please do get in touch with helen or i via the simplecast link or via linkedin but thank you very much for listening and have a great day thanks so much Ariel. thank you that was fun If you're interested in anything that's been discussed on the podcast or would like to be involved as a guest or have a topic to share, please get in touch with Helen or I via LinkedIn. Full details can be found in the episode notes on the Simplecast site.